Well, I think since we're all here and it's just 12 o'clock, that we should jump in and get started this afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Judith Herb College of Education first for spring symposium. Um, and the title of our symposium is Stories Matter. And we chose that story or that title rather because we know that every single one of us, every third grader sitting in though at Marshall, um, all of the uh, other people in at the school in Marshall, all of the teachers, all of us have wonderful stories that we can tell about ourselves. And we sometimes we tell about our family members. Sometimes we talk about and tell stories about our pets or what happened to us on the playground or uh, what we even what we had for dinner. Um, that often, those are the kinds of stories we tell. And every time we tell a story, we get to know a little bit more about ourselves. And the people who hear our stories get to learn about our, about who we are. And then when we listen to other people's stories, we learn about them. And we think that's a pretty important and kind of a great way that we all get to know about each other. And so today um, we have lots of really uh, important people with us in this particular session. And I'd first like to acknowledge all the third graders at Marshall. We are so glad that you are here, third graders. Um, yay, third graders. Um, absolutely. Um, and we have a very special guest with us um, who is somebody who has lots of stories to tell, but rather than just tell his stories, he's actually written his stories down so he can share them with people far and wide. And not only has he written the words that tell his stories, but he's drawn, created the illustrations or the pictures that go along with those stories. Um, our special guest who is with us this afternoon is Ino Santo Nagra. Nagara, I'm sorry. I. Yes. Okay. All good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I'm going to actually stop talking and, and, you know, turn it over to you. Um, you've met our third graders. Um, so I'm going to mute myself and let you take it over. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Good morning or afternoon, I guess, for you. I'm in Oakland, California. Um, so here it's morning. It's nine o'clock in the morning and it's exciting for me to be able to come all the way over to visit you without having to get on an airplane these days. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yes, thanks for having me. Uh, I am, my name is Ino Santa Nagara. I'm originally from Jakarta, Indonesia, and I am an author and illustrator of children's books. The first book that I wrote was called A is for Activist. And this was a board book that I wrote for my kid, basically, when uh, he was two years old. And it was a book that I just thought I was gonna just you know, make for myself to read with my kid over and over and over again. And as it turns out, it was a book that a lot of other people like to, and it became a bestseller. And when people ask me, well, now that you have a book that you've written, what's your next book going to be? I didn't really know the answer to that question because I didn't really think I was going to become a children's book author. I just wrote one book. And as it as it so happens, I ended up having some other ideas. I'll talk a little bit more about all this later, but um, I just wanted to go a little bit through. I went I, from writing A's for Activist, I ended up writing another one called Counting on Community that's also a board book. And then as my kid got a little older, you all are in third grade, I think, but this was when um, he was a little bit younger than you. We ended up 
talking about a story that happened to me when I was a kid, and that ended up becoming my night in the planetarium. And then after that, I ended up writing the wedding portrait. So then I ended up writing a whole bunch of children's books. <clears throat> and so today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my my first picture book, my night in the planetarium, with you all. I think some of you might have seen it in real life. Um, it's a, the, the actual book's got there. Great. Um, we're going to put it on the screen. I'm going to read the book so you can hear it in my voice. And we will then be able to talk about anything you all want to talk about. Um, if you have questions about what happened in the book, if you want to talk about um, writing stories for children or adults, if you want to talk about the illustrations, because I did all the drawings on this. I'm originally more of an illustrator. Um, I'm happy to talk about any of all of that. Uh, but I figure the best way is to start with the story. Does that work for everybody? All right. Great. Oh, it's good to be able to see you once in a while. Sorry, it's you go in and out. So I'm used to being able to see you, all you kids. But <laughs> let's. Okay, so All right. Look in front of you as well. Great. So everybody can see the cover of the book. This is called My Night in the Planetarium, a true story about a child, a play, and the art of resistance. When I was seven, I got to spend the night in a planetarium. This is a true story. Do you want to hear it? Does everybody know what a planetarium is? Yes, no, I can't see totally, but in case you're not familiar with what a planetarium is, planetarium is like a movie theater. It's round usually, and you sit back in your seats and you watch the movie on the ceiling. It's usually something about planets and stars and the solar system. So that's why they call it a planetarium. But the experience in a planetarium is you sit back, you look up, and the, there's a whole bunch of different and cameras that, and uh, uh, projectors that end up projecting the movie all over the scene. So it feels like you're going out into outer space. And it's completely dark. So that's a planetarium. All right. So when I was seven, I got to spend the night in a planetarium. I was born in Indonesia. Only three countries in the world have more people than Indonesia. Do you know what they are? China, India, the United States, and then comes Indonesia. Indonesia is an archipelago, which means it's made up of lots of islands. There are 17,000 islands in Indonesia. There are 300 different ethnic groups, and people speak 750 different languages and dialects. Indonesia is rich in natural resources fish from the sea, fruit from the trees, and spices. Oh, the spices. Indonesia is where the Spice Islands are. When you learn about Columbus, you will learn that he was looking for the Spice Islands when he got lost and was shipwrecked in Haiti. But that is another story. Let's get back to Indonesia. People from all over the world came to Indonesia to buy spices. Some of them, like the Dutch, decided to stay. We Indonesians are really nice, so we let them stay. They stayed for 350 years. So finally, Indonesians decided it was time for the Dutch to go home. They hadn't been very good guests. They stole our spices, they took over our government, and they put people in jail if they complained. So people from all across the Indonesian islands decided to unite and kick them out. We called this the Indonesian Revolution. After the revolution, we all lived happily ever after the end. No, not really. This is a true story, so things are more complicated than that. Just before I was born, a new ruler came to power. He was a general from the military and was used to everyone following his orders. He ruled Indonesia with an iron fist. Lots of people were afraid of him. He let his family and friends get rich while the rest of the country was poor. And just like the Dutch, his army put people in jail if they complained. My dad, who you would call Datuk in Indonesia, is a poet and a playwright. 
He and his friends would gather for poetry readings, and he had a theater troupe that put on plays that lots of people would come to watch. Dato and his theater troupe believed in free speech and didn't think that the general was treating people well. So they decided to do a play about how that was wrong. They put up posters all over town and they called the place, that's Indonesia for hush or be quiet. Or, well, you probably know other ruder ways to tell someone you want them to stop speaking, don't you? We're not going to do that here. The theater troupe would rehearse their play in our garage every day. I would hang out and listen. Because I was seven and a good listener, I was able to memorize the whole play. When the actors would forget their lines, I would remind them. I think this annoyed them a bit. So they finally said, hey, if you're going to be so good at remembering all those lines, you should be in the play. So my dad made a part for me. I got to be a spy. The play was really popular. Lots of people came to see it because they'd heard that it was a clever play. It was a story about people who were being ruled by an evil king from another land. But the people united and kicked out the king. There were many heroes, but one hero in particular stood out and became their new leader. But then that new leader started acting like the old king, letting his family get rich and putting people in jail who complained. Everyone knew the play was about the general, but since it didn't actually say it was about him, they hoped that they wouldn't get into trouble. Our family traveled across Indonesia with the theater troupe performing the play. Everywhere the play went, more and more people came to see it. At the same time, people across Indonesia were protesting against the general. University students were protesting in the streets, poets were reading po protest poems, and folk singers were singing protest songs. Some of them were arrested for saying what they really thought. That's when we heard that the general was really mad. He'd ordered his soldiers to arrest my dad and the other actors. The soldiers were going to come after the play closed and the audience had gone home. So that night, Everyone in my dad's theater troupe brought their toothbrushes to the performance. They figured, well, if you're going to go to jail for a long time, you may as well have your toothbrush with you so you can keep your teeth clean. Remember, this is a true story. The performance was in a huge theater complex called Tim. There were indoor stages, outdoor stages, a movie theater, and even a planetarium. During the week, I took Balinese dance lessons in one of the smaller theaters. Since my dad's play was really popular, they were performing it in the biggest outdoor theater. The final performance was a success, but sure enough, after the audience left, the soldiers came to find my dad. And yet, he was nowhere to be found. The theater was empty. My dad and all the actors had snuck out with the audience. My mom and I had said goodbye to him as he got into a bajai. So a bajai is, is that, um, that orange vehicle you can see there it has three wheels one wheel in one front two in back and the driver actually drives in front like a motorcycle but then you have um, two seats in the back and sometimes you squeeze in three four maybe five people even in the back seat so that's a bad day um, something that it's like a taxi in indonesia my mom and i had said goodbye to him as he got into a bajai in the alley behind the theater then he headed out of town to lay low for a while. The problem was we couldn't go home either because we had heard that the soldiers were waiting at our house. That's when my mom said, let's go to the planetarium. So my mom and I went to the planetarium and watched the show. Then we watched it again and again. It was dark and beautiful under the stars and we were safe. I fell asleep on my mother's lap and that is how I got to spend the night in the planetarium. Sorry, I had to cough there for a second. So that's the, the end. That's the story of the planetarium. I'm going to read a little bit of um, what's called an epilogue. This is sort of a lot of kids have questions about what happened before and after that. So I'm going to read a little bit of what I have about that um, and then we can talk so i hope you enjoyed my story i know some of it might have seemed a bit scary for a kid but honestly it wasn't scary for me at the time i knew my family would take good care of me that stayed away for a while but then came back 
and did many other plays. I got to be in some of those plays, too. Everyone thought that I was going to grow up to be an actor, but I decided I wanted to study biology, and now I'm an activist and a graphic artist. <clears throat> it's okay to change your mind about what you want to be when you grow up. That was me in one of the plays. Meanwhile, <clears throat> my dad continued to do new things, too. He did cutting-edge solo plays. Those are plays where he was the only actor in them. He got to read his poetry on national TV. He ran for parliament and is now a famous movie star. He has won many awards, including Indonesia's equivalent to an Oscar. The general ended up ruling Indonesia for over 30 years. He was finally forced to step down in 1998 after massive demonstrations across the country led by students. Sometime after that, the general died. The end. <clears throat> Thank you. So that's the story. Um, how do we want to do this? Should I, are our kids asking questions through the chat or someone want to read questions or how do we, what's the best way to interact? Um, I, I thought maybe if we could, I could have a kid come up. Sure. And then that way you could see their face. Great. And then yes, they that's could perfect. Ask, they could ask the question that way, if that's okay. Yep. That works okay. for me. Dixon, does that work for you? Okay, cool. Um, Dixon, why don't we take turns? Like, I do one and you do one. Okay. Um, who wants to go first? David? Yeah. <laughs> How long did, did it take you to write the book? Can you come close to me? You bring your card? Or you got it? You know what it is? Oh, you got a different one? Okay, that's fine. All right, ready? Can you see yeah. him? Yeah. Go ahead. When was the first time you seen him, seen him after um, you left? Wait, hold on, wait, you go first, then you'll go, okay? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear him? Yeah, I'm sort of going back and forth between. So, and because you have masks, I'm not sure who's speaking. Okay. <laughs> oh. When, you want to pull your mask down? Pull your mask down. Oh. But when your dad ended up loving, leaving, when did you... Uh, when did you first see him when he came back? About like how long? When, when I'm sorry. He said, hold on. He said when your dad left. Oh, I see. Yes. And how long was it again until you until saw him? Until I saw him again. Yeah. Um, so that's a good question, you know, because it's interesting, you know, he had to leave and people, you would think that because he had, you know, the military was coming after him, that then he would have to hide for a long time. And the uh, general ended up not actually um, leaving office for another 20 years. But um, my dad actually, he was only gone for about two weeks. Um, it was an interesting thing about the way that politics worked in Indonesia at the time. It was more like when they were looking for him, he had to not get caught. But then they, and he was paying attention to what was going on. And then when they figured out, okay, I think they're not after him anymore. Then he actually came back and went on and was just careful about what he did. Some of his friends um, who were doing other things, there was a poet named Rendra who was very famous at the time. And he ended up under what they call house arrest. So he didn't, they didn't take him to jail, but they, he was not allowed to leave his house for, uh, I think like a month or something like that. It's a good question. Okay, Jiraiya has a question. Can you say it nice and loud? Um, how long did it take you to write the book? To write the book? So, a lot of authors really don't like to hear my answer when people ask me how long it takes me to write a book. But my answer is actually, it takes me about a day. Wow. Now, now that's not entirely true. So, it what happens is... The way I write, I just, when I have a story that I want to write, I just write it really quickly. It's not complete. It's not final. It's not well written in the way that it is when it's complete. But what it is, is it's, I just, my process around writing is I can't 
overthink it. I have to just like write it really quickly. Uh, write it the way I would tell the story if I was telling you right now and it was just coming off the top of my head. And then I go back and I edit it and I rewrite it and I rework it and I read it with kids and I listen to what they say and then I change things in it. So the actual process from when I start writing a book to when it gets published, it's about a year. But I feel like if I tell people it takes a year to write a book, then it feels like, well, why would you ever want to do that? That takes too long, especially if you're a kid. A year seems like forever. But um, my sort of advice is if you have a story, write it really quickly. Don't worry about whether it sounds nice or perfect and don't get hung up. Um, you know, the writer's block people have, it's sort of like they get too hung up on like trying to get it to sound perfect. Doesn't matter. Just let it flow out of you and then come back and fix it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Landers, do you have someone that wants to ask a question? Go ahead, Ms. Dixon. Okay. Say hi, my name is Devin. Hi, my name is Devin. Hi, Devin. Hi, Devin. Why did you make this book? Why did you make the Why book? Why did I make the book? That's a good question. Um, there's a couple different reasons. One is that you know, when I, after I wrote A is for Activists and Counting on Community, um, people kept on asking me, what is your next book going to be? And as I said earlier, I didn't really think of myself as a children's book writer. I just happened to have written a couple books. But does that make me a writer? I don't know. I didn't think I was a writer. So I didn't think that I was going to have another book to write. And I was sitting down with some people and they said, you know, and we were having dinner and I was telling the story about how, you know, I was growing up in Indonesia and, um, you know, I actually, like I knew uh, the guy who later became President Obama because he was also in Indonesia when I was a kid. And there was, you know, I was just telling stories. And I told this story about spending the night in the planetarium and they said, that should be your next book. So part of it is I wrote it because People said, you should write that book. Um, but mostly I wrote it because it's a story that I wanted to tell to my kid and the kids in my community about, not just really about me or about my experience staying in the, in the planetarium, but about the idea that we live in a world where there are sometimes bad things that happen. I lived under a military dictatorship with a very mean general as the president, but, um, and I also wanna talk about colonialism. This is how the Dutch came and took over Indonesia and how Indonesia um, has had a lot of challenges is, uh, because of the history of colonialism. And I wanted to be able to find a way to talk to my kid and the other kids in my life about these ideas, about colonialism, about, about dictatorship, but not just about that, but also about the things that we can do about it, about how art and theater and protest can all be part of resistance against these kind of things and how change can happen and how you know there is the possibility of a good future if we fight for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Okay, I have Dominic. You can pull your mouth down to ask your question so we can hear you. Make sure you talk really low. Did you make your Can't hear him. He said, when did you make your, the first book or this book? When did you make this book that you read to us? Mm. I wrote the planetarium book, I think it was 2005 or 2006. Um, this was when my kid was in uh, first grade. You all are in third grade. So it was a little bit for slightly older kids, but I figured first graders could handle it. Um, but I was thinking about kids who were first, second, and third grade when I was writing it. Thank you. Right. Come on up and introduce yourself. You can take your mask down so we can hear you. Go ahead. That's Kalani. You gotta talk loud like you're on a playground. <laughs> My name is Kalani. Hi, Kalani. 
Where is your mom? My mom is my mom in Indonesia. Is um, she lives actually on an island now called Bali. Um, she used to live in an island called Java, but um, my parents have, have recently uh, moved to Bali. Jordan, you have a question? This is Trinity. Hey, Trinity. She wants to know how old you were when you wrote your first book. Ooh, I was 42 years old. That's old. And that was a while ago, too. <laughs> He's answering that question right now. Thank you. Thank you. No, okay. He was asking the same question. So, um, how old I was? Yeah. How old you are? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. How did you learn to draw, to be able mm. to illustrate? Was that just naturally, or did you take classes or lessons, or? I've never taken a class or lesson outside of, um, you know, in school they would have art class um, when I was a kid. Um, I wouldn't, I don't like to say things are, it's natural as much as I grew up in a family where these things were encouraged and allowed and I knew to be possible. Um, my father is a poet and playwright, as you heard in the book. Uh, my mother is a linguist. I grew up in a family that was uh, in a community of where, where there were many people who were artists um, and I you know, I don't think it's because I somehow was born good at it, but when I started drawing and start, you know, I, I always had the tools around me, you know, pencils, crayons, my, my parents did play a strong role in it. For instance, um, they, they really encouraged me to, to play with, to use colored pencils instead of markers when I was really young. And I think that that made something of, and not against markers, but um, it was just a way that, that they always is said, you know, you should just go for it and you should learn to play with all these tools. And they always, they always were, were like, they were, they, it was never like, like, oh, that's good, or that's not good, or this is how you're supposed to do it, um, kind of thing. It was always, you know, oh, have fun with it. So I think what's, you know, there's a lot of people who have a lot of really strong opinions about what is good drawing or bad drawing. I always felt my drawing <clears throat> was great, even though if I look back at my drawings, it's not what all my friends thought was cool at the time, but I was confident in my drawing, and that allowed me to 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 get into this whole career of illustration and and graphic design. Thank you. Okay. This is November. She has a question. Nice and Do you have any brothers or sisters? I do have one brother. Um, he's a musician, so it is interesting that everybody ended up in the arts in one way or another. Um, but it's almost like we all had to find our own way. You know, my mother was a linguist, so I couldn't get into doing things too much with language. I, my father was a poet and playwright, so he was a performance artist. So I didn't end up getting into theater or performance. And my brother ended up getting into music and the rest of us have no ear for music in my family. <laughs> and um, I got into illustration and graphic design. And um, and so that, you know, it's sort of like we all had to find, find our own place. But my brother is 11 years younger than me. So um, we didn't really grow up together i was by the time he was um old enough you know he was born when i was 11 um but then i by the time he was eight years old um you know i had moved on to i had moved to college in the united states wow thank you i find it very interesting about i never realized there was that many islands connected or not necessarily connected but Mm -hmm. It says people speak 750 different languages and dialects. Are you all able to understand all of those languages and dialects? Or is there like any, I'm not sure, how, miscommunication? Yeah, so 
what what we have is in Indonesia is is what sort of the the national language, which is Indonesian, Bahasa Indonesia. That's the um, lingua franca, and it, it's based on a version of Malay, which is what is spoken in um, in most mostly Western Indonesia and um, in some of Malaysia. So that was sort of the language that people used for as traders. But across the different um, the, the different ethnic groups, the la they are distinct languages. My mother's a linguist, you know, and so some of them might be dialects from each other, but most of them are actually distinct languages. Um, and while we may now in the modern era, after a lot more sort of interaction, we, there's some common words that end up getting used, but they are literally different languages. So no, we don't understand each other. I, I lived in Jakarta, which is, um, you know, a huge city, and in that, in Jakarta, the language, the the indigenous language is called Batawi, which I don't understand because I grew up speaking Indonesian. And then right next door, if you drive about forty five minutes out of Jakarta, you get into the area of what's called Western Java. The Sundanese people are mostly there. Um, in the hills, they speak Sundanese, and none of me or my friends could understand Sundanese. So we could speak with younger people who all had learned the the common language, but um, but if you know, there's, there were some people from before the revolution, older people at the time, um, who we couldn't speak the same name with, and this is literally half an hour away, and this is across wow. the seventeen thousand islands. Yeah, it's pretty diverse. Thank you. All right. Hi, this is Jose. Jose has a question. Can you talk really well? Hi, Jose. Why did you write about yourself? He wants why to know why he wants to know why you wrote a book about yourself. Mm. Um, mm. That's a good question, you know, uh, because actually in most of my books are kind of about myself. I think it's mostly um, because I wanted to write the story that I stories that are based about things that matter to me, but I needed to I wanted to tell them from a perspective that I knew I could trust. Um, I'm, and that was my own perspective. I wanted to have the the main story be something that I could really own. There's a lot of conversation right now about who gets to write what stories and about whom, you know. And so, to me, it was important that the easiest way for me to write a story that I knew was a story that I owned um, was to write about my own stories. Um, I don't think that you can't write about other things from other perspectives, and I think people should do that for sure. But for me, that was the easiest shortcut. Thank you. Do you like your book? <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad question, you know, um, because sometimes you start a process around writing a book and people tell you, you know, yeah, you need to write that, finish it, and they make you change it because they want to, uh, how, they think it should be better this way and that way, and you end up with something that you don't necessarily love. Um, and, you know, I would say that that ideally you would you know, this is, it's always a, a process, you know, there's things that I can be wrong about. So I do listen to those voices and I do try to find out, you know, try it out to see whether it really is something that, you know, should I change it to make it what other people are saying that it should be. But then there's always the question of, of, you know, what is it that I want it to be? So the, it's a, it's a back and forth um, with A is for activists. My first book, um, I, I showed, I read it with some people and somebody who I really respected, who is a really amazing poet, um, wrote back to me and said, Ed, you know, this is how you should do it. I don't think the way you're doing it is right. And I, I actually sat down and tried to rewrite it um, the way that they suggested. 
and it wasn't a bad idea and I respected their opinion, but I ended up going back and, and saying, you know what, I think I'm going to stick with the way I'm going to, I wanted to do it. And I'm very happy that I did that. Um, so finding, you know, the balance between being true to your own ideas and also listening to input from other people is, is kind of the trick, but. The answer to the question is yes, I do like my book at this point and the books that um, that I have published are in a format in a way that I feel good about. Thank you. Okay, I have Jayla here with a question. Can you ask it nice and loud? Okay, remind me what it was. Yes, she he um she wants to know how many books have you written? I have written six books um, at this point. I have a seventh one that's coming out that I didn't write. Um, I worked with a friend of mine named Mona, and she did the writing of it. But um, but and I just did the illustration, so that's coming out in the in the fall. But <clears throat> all all the books that I wrote right now, it, there's six. And how many books? I'm adding to her question. How many mm -hmm. books have you have you done any other books outside of your own that you've just done the illustration for? The one coming out this fall is the first time I've done a whole book that I've done the illustration okay. for. There's a, a number of books that are are anthologies that have writings from different people and illustrations from different people, and then they'll they'll include um, one or two of my drawings in them. But um, as far as like illustrating it from start to finish, I usually. I usually illustrate my own books, um, but this other one was was one that I was making an exception for. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And this is Jordan, and Jordan has a question. Nice and loud. Hey, Jordan. Um, did you know why you spent the night at the planetarium? Oh, that's at a the good time. question. Yes, yeah, it's a very good yeah. question. I did. Um, but what's interesting is that yeah i mean they did you know my mom did say you know like you know i don't think we should go home um because and the reason you because you know, i had to i i didn't have to know why my dad was leaving too um and in indonesia at the time you know i think kids understanding what w was going on was um was important and i think that's true now too for you kids a lot of people feel like they shouldn't tell kids about things because they're afraid that they're going to be uh, scared of it and then so they end up telling kids things that are not complete and in some ways that can i think that that can be more difficult because then you're not totally sure what's going on and you can't trust that you're being told everything that you need to know and so i th i think that part of this story is about how you know, growing up in Indonesia at the time, you know, I knew what was going on and I knew, you know, but I, but I wasn't scared because <clears throat> I had confidence and I trusted my parents and I knew that they were telling me what I needed to know um, and how to deal with it in a way that, um, that we would be okay. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have Aliciana here and she has a question. Do you want to ask it or do you want me to ask it? She's going to talk really loud. I'm not getting anything. This... Yeah, I, I couldn't hear it all. Nice and loud, like you're That's screaming somebody. at somebody. You like act. Did you like <laughs> acting? Like repeat it, Don. Oh, yeah. That's good. Yeah, I think it might be the microphone because I feel like on one one of the computers I can hear kids and on the other one I can't and I don't I think everybody's speaking really well. Um, did I, the question was, did I like acting? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you were younger. Yeah, I, I really I did. I. Um, I don't know what happened. Uh, there wasn't a particular moment or anything, but I went from just, you know, I, I got into it because it was fun. I just thought it was, you know, and it was a great thing to be part of the whole grown up world to be able to be acting on a national stage. Um, and then at some point, I just sort of started getting shy and I decided that I, I didn't like it. Um, it made me stressed out and I ended up not wanting to do it. Um, 
And what's interesting is that's that kind of ended up being the way that I thought of myself for probably the next 40 years or so. <laughs> and then it wasn't until I wrote these books and I started needing to go to classrooms to read the books with kids that I started realizing that actually, you know, this isn't acting so much, but I, I do enjoy talking to groups of kids um, and I'm maybe not as shy as I thought I was. So <laughs> you can change <laughs> even when you're 50. <laughs> Thank you. It's not. Did the planetarium keep you calm? Did the planetarium keep me calm? Yeah, you know, it was relaxing. You know, what's funny is I, I was able to go back to that planetarium about three years ago, um, and it's still there. And kids are still going to that planetarium on a regular basis to go and relax and learn about the stars and the universe. Yeah, I think planetariums are, you know, there's just something about a planetarium when all the lights go down, it's completely dark. Um, if you haven't been to a planetarium, if you ever get a chance to, it's so cool because you get transported to another place, to a to another universe. Okay, we have one more question. David had another question, and he wanted to know if there were. He wants to know if you ever experienced people um, or where you live, I guess, is what he's asking. Did you ever experience people not liking other people because of their color or because of their race? Hmm. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, it makes sense. Uh, if you're talking about in Indonesia, <clears throat> Indonesia is interesting because of the hundreds of different ethnic groups, there is a lot of, um, from early on, from when the country was first created, a big part of the concept of Indonesia was this concept of unity and diversity, Bineka Tunggal Ika, or what the United States calls, you know, e pluribus unum. In the United States, there's also this idea of unity and diversity. But in Indonesia, because it was so diverse, I think um, there was just from early on a lot more, you know, pick kids grow up from, from, you know, day one in school and everywhere else talking about the importance of diversity and the differences between people. Um, now, even with all that, it doesn't mean that there weren't people who were racist. And, you know, in the Eastern Indonesia, people tend to be, you know, darker skinned or in the um, in northern Indonesia, you know, there's people who are more indigenous people who live in more traditional indigenous ways in it. So modern people, you know, modern city people would be racist against darker skinned indigenous people. So, you know, it, the, the idea of racism definitely you know, not the idea, the practice of the the experience of it is definitely something that um, people experience in Indonesia as well. I I do think um, the the differences are are less than they are here, where you have um, you know in the United States a country that was sort of built around the. Um, the power of the colonial powers that came to the United States, the um, and then and then there's the whole experience of enslaved people being brought to the United States um, against their will, and then there's the experience of indigenous people and people from uh, other parts of the the Americas who end up in the United States. That I think, I think makes it um, an even sort of sharper divide. But um, but yeah. Racism is a problem in many places. Something that we can keep working on. Thank you very much. When you decided to get published, how did you go about that? Um, I originally didn't think I was going to get published. I just did the book for myself and my family. Um, I just made it myself. Um, 
and I realized that if I wanted to have it in board book format, I was going to need to print more than just a couple hundred. Um, so I ended up uh, figuring, okay, well, I'll just self publish it and, you know, send it out to people and maybe sell them to friends and family over the next five years or something. And so I ended up printing up about 3000 of them at a print shop. Um, I had to borrow some money. <laughs> and <clears throat> it turns out that I sort of underestimated how many people were going to be interested in this book. And it sold out quite quickly. And then I had to decide, am I going to keep on doing that because I was basically had 3000 books sitting in my living room and I was having to mail them out every day to bookstores and people who wanted to buy them online. And I thought I would see if a publisher would take it on. And I, um, I sent out letters to various publishers and most of them didn't want it. Most of them still thought it was too controversial that it's not, you know, kids weren't going to like it. Um, and one publisher, seven stories press, decided to take a risk and they published it and it ended up being a bestseller for them. And it turns out lots of kids like it. Thank you. This was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I think the third graders had wonderful questions for you, Eno. Yes. I think they were really, really interesting. And actually, um, I'd like to invite the third graders if they have, if all of this conversation today has made them think about a particular story that they'd like to tell, that they'd like to write and or illustrate, if you would be interested in doing that, we would be more than happy to make sure that Eno gets an opportunity to see those stories because um, you know, he's talked a little bit about what it's like to be a writer, and I know you're all working on your writing now. And so um, we would love to hear any of the stories that you might um, that you might like to tell and you might like to illustrate. So that would be great. That would yes, be wonderful. absolutely. I, I love seeing the work that your kids do. Um, you know, I'm also, you know, any questions you have about stuff, um, I'm on email. You can always contact me through your your teachers and adults in your lives. I'm, I'm always happy to, to keep this conversation going. Ah, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, I think um, because we have another session coming up, um, I'm going to draw this one to an, to a close. Thank you so much, Ms. Dixon and Ms. Landris. We appreciate you joining us today and joining us with your students. Um, we also want to thank um, all of our other attendees who are with us. Um, we uh, hope you enjoyed this session. We know that you learned a lot. We, I certainly did as we, uh, as we were thinking together and, and listening to, to Eno's stories. So thanks everybody. Have a good rest of your day and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thanks Thank for you. Having me. Thanks. Thanks.